Hi, everyone. We'll be starting in a few minutes. All right, I think we will get started as people keep joining us. Welcome to our monitoring and compliance training series. My name is Stacy, and I'm joined today by Melanie, who is a HUD TA consultant. Today is part two of our training series, eligible costs and activities, program income and match. The presentation will be recorded and it will be available after the training. We will also pop in the chat a uh, copy of the PDF so you have to follow along. Because we are in a webinar format again and we've been having some trouble with figuring out how uh, to get our video to function on this format. So unfortunately, we'll be off video again, um, but hopefully the PDF will help. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A chat function and we'll do our best to answer those as they come up. Um, but we will also leave time at the end for additional Q&A. All right, next slide, please. So today we'll be covering program components and eligible costs, match. We'll also take a short break and then cover match record keeping and monitoring requirements, common findings and financial management. Next slide. The goal of today is to pro provide information to better understand the program component. Um, for example, permanent supportive housing versus rapid rehousing. We'll briefly touch on in the first session, we went over in more detail. Um, so today it's just an overview. We'll also go over eligible costs under each program type. And our goal is also to help understand match requirements and how to receive and spend program income. Next slide, please. 
So before we start, though, we'd like to get a sense, again, of kind of where people are at on the specific topic. Um, so we'll have a poll question pop up here if you'd like to participate. And the question is, what is your experience with designing and tracking match resources for a COC program project? So we'll give a couple of a minute or two for that. Okay, so here we go. So we have some results coming in and it looks like the majority of folks are somewhat familiar and also are willing to learn and have not had a lot of training on this. So that's perfect. That's exactly uh, what we hope to kind of provide today. All right, so we are going to next get into the program components and eligible costs. So the first program component is permanent housing and HUD defines this as community-based housing without a designated length of stay. This includes both permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing. To be considered permanent housing, the program participant must be the tenant on a lease or sublease for a year, which is renewable for terms that are at least one month and is terminal, terminable only for cause. Um, the lease is, as you all know, a written agreement that's between the landlord and participant. But in the case of leasing or sponsor-based rental assistance, it's between the participant and the agency. Um, and just a note of clarification, when we say permanent housing is designated uh, without, sorry, without a designated length of stay, we want to just emphasize rapid rehousing, of course, financial assistance is limited um, up to 24 months, but the idea and goal is that they have um, an unlimited length of stay in their same unit if they continue on in that unit with their own subsidy, their own support. Next slide, please. So going more into detail of each of the two program types, permanent supportive housing provides long-term rental assistance and supportive services to individuals or families with a disability. Long-term assistance means that housing assistance does not have a designated end date and is provided until the participant chooses to exit the project or is terminated from the project. Um, as another kind of side note, we went over this in the in session one, but again, for projects dedicated to serving people experiencing chronic homelessness, the head of the household must have the qualifying disability. So most, most if not all of our PSH programs in our COC require that households um, meet the chronic homeless status. Um, for rapid rehousing, this provides tenant rental assistance and supportive services to participants up to 24 months. Again, it's intended to be permanent, um, though meaning the program participant stays in the unit after the assistance ends. Next slide. So again, that was just a really brief overview. Um, session one has more information, but we also are providing some links here that have information about the program components eligible costs, which we'll be going over um, next. And it also includes information about the joint transitional housing, rapid rehousing project type, because we aren't covering it um, in this session. Next slide. 
So this chart shows eligible costs based on the program component. Um, as you can see, not all costs are eligible under every program type, um, but your project application and based on the NOFA for the year and other additional regulations uh, will determine the details for your specific project of what eligible costs you have available to you. And that's uh, what we we'll talked about in the next slide. So eligible costs are those that are included in the COC program interim rule, um, as shown on this slide. But in the next slide, um, if we can go to the next slide, Joe, thank you. Um, we are distinguishing between the two. So your approved costs are those that are the budget line items specifically approved by HUD in your grant agreement. So although, you know, in the previous slide, all of those costs are eligible for a specific program component, it's important to look at your specific budget that's been approved by HUD to see what eligible costs um, are included for your project. So during the NOFO competition, your agency will submit an application with their proposed project budget with these specific items. So if you're wondering, how do I get those items in our budget? This is housed during this process. So things like leasing dollars, HMIS dollars, and then HUD reviews that project application and budget. And if it's approved as submitted, it will then be incorporated into the grant agreement. So recipients must receive, must request and receive prior HUD approval to meet substantial changes to their project budget after it's been approved. So next we're gonna go into the specific costs of specifics of each eligible cost. And we're gonna start with operating costs and I'm gonna hand that over to Melanie. Great, thank you, Stacy. Um, hi everyone, my name is Melanie Mondello. I work for the Technical Assistance Collaborative and I'm working with your COC staff to um, help provide these trainings and answer any questions that you may have about this really dense um, material. So I'm gonna be talking about operating before I pass it back to Stacy to go through the other types of eligible costs. So operating, um, we're gonna go over two slides here. Um, there's general operating, which when I look at your project list is, a, I think maybe two, maybe three projects in your COC, um, this slide would apply to you. Um, general operating rules and allowances that you see on the slide are for projects that do not have rental assistance, do not have leasing, and have typically a site-based um, project that was funded um, previous to the COC program rule implementing. So for operating, um, HUD allows for you to charge, track and charge the costs that will support the day-to-day -day, um, physical operations of the building, I think is the best way to put it. So you can think about the maintenance and repair. It could be a building that you own. Um, it could be a building that you rent, um, typically their own. So it would be maintenance and repair as long as at least, I think it's 51% of the building where the housing project is, um, is for housing and is for this project, then security um, would be an eligible cost. It would be prorated if you're sharing the building. Um, just like all structures, there's gonna be utility costs. So those are allowable under operating. Furniture that stays with the program um, is allowed under operating. And then the equipment for, again, the housing structure um, that's being supported. Um, it's important to note, because we get this question a lot, um, about um, can operating under COC program, can it support um, shelter? And the answer is no, <laughs> um, it can't. It can only do the things that um, we described in session one and the eligible costs on the chart um, that Stacy referenced. So. Um, it's really for making sure that the building is functional and available to the people, typically, again, in a housing project in your COC. So that's general operating. Um, the next slide, I wanted to make the distinction between if you have an operating budget line item, and you'll hear us refer to that as a BLI, 
So if you have operating, but you're actually a leasing program, which is um, Stacy will talk about more, if you have those two together. I did this slide as a strike through. So you can see in the regulation, you will see all the things you can do with operating. But if you're actually a housing leasing project with an operating budget line item, basically for your utilities, these are the things that you can do. So um, if you have a leasing program that also has an operating budget line item, that operating budget line item can help support the utilities that aren't included in the lease, basically the ones that are not the landlord's responsibility. Um, HUD has also um, allowed the insurance to cover any um, liability that you have for obligations under the master lease or lease document. That information isn't in the interim rule. That's guidance that HUD has given since the rule was published. Um, so I just wanted to really highlight what, what operating means if it's within a housing leasing program so that you don't get excited and go start buying furniture because that's not... Um, that is not the model there. It's, it's really meant for just these few things. Um, if you have any questions about how you're spending your operating fund and leasing project, you should definitely get in contact with your COC staff. Um, and if you're a subrecipient, obviously your recipient so that you can get clarity because in your um, invoices that you do each month, right, you're going to have to step this out. So um, basically, it's things that the landlord doesn't have to pay for is what you can cover, um, things that aren't in the lease. So that's a quick overview of operating, and I'm going to pass it back to Stacy for leasing. And just a reminder, as you have questions, please use the Q&A, pop it in there, but we'll also open up for questions a couple times throughout the presentation. So Stacy, back to you. Thanks, Melanie. So leasing dollars, recipients and subs may choose to use these funds to lease a structure or a portion of a structure or individual units to provide housing or supportive services. So it can be used to pay up to 100% of these costs, but they cannot be used to lease units or structures owned by the recipient, sub recipient or any related organization. Um, there is exception. There is um, an exception if HUD allows for it, but you do have to submit for that. Next slide, please. So beyond the unit rent costs, projects can also make payments for security deposits and first and last month's rent as funding allows. These costs can also be covered with program income or matching funds, which we'll go over more in this um, Leasing projects can also pay for a vacant unit because the lease is between the landlord and the recipient or sub-recipient, and they must fulfill the terms of the lease. So the exception to this would be if the lease is written to end when a participant moves out of a unit. Um, it's really important Note, to note also that projects could have a policy for how to handle extended absences. So if a participant is out of the unit, um, including how they will the notice will be given to them and how long it will be held for them if they want to return to the project. Next slide. So for projects with rental assistance funds, um, these can be paid or sorry, used to pay for renting a unit, uh, which can be short, medium, or long-term. Um, and it can be used tenant-based, project-based, or sponsored-based. Um, the different types, lengths, and requirements of the rental assistance differ depending on this, on the program component. Um, so based on what is listed in your project application and what's been approved, um, that's what you'll be using for the specific rental assistance. Next slide. So in addition to rent, rental assistance can also be paid, can pay for first and last month's rent. You can use up to two months rent and security deposit and up to a month's rent for property damages. This isn't allowed though in projects that are rapid rehousing with rental assistance um, line items. 
You can also use it to pay up to 30 days in vacancy payments and also for staff costs in carrying out um, eligible activities that are directly related to um, rental assistance activities. So many rental assistance grants build savings due to participants paying a portion of the rent and an unexpected vacancy so that can also be used. Next slide. There are other eligible costs under rental assistance and this includes this list on the right. I won't read through all of them, but it can include um, things like examining someone's income and family composition, receiving new participants into the program. Expenses for rental assistance can be paid for um, using matching funds. Again, we're gonna cover that more in detail. If the project is not 100% leased, rental assistance funds can be used, or if the project is 100% leased, but the project is paying at or below FMR, then it can use those excess grant funds. Next slide. So recipients and subs may also use COC program funds to pay for supportive services that address the needs of participants to help them obtain and maintain housing. This is a primary source of in-kind service match. It's important to note that if it is used as match, just to remember that the documentation of those services should show how it links to the participant's housing stability. Next slide. So in general, grant funds may be used only on those services listed in the interim rule. Again, I'm not gonna read this whole list here, but it includes activities like assessing service needs, case management, food. If you want a description of each of the services and examples, they are available in the interim rule, but we're also going to be releasing it in our manual. Um, that should be completed by the end of the year. So we're really excited to be finishing that and uh, sharing that with you all um, to be able to refer to some of these uh, more detailed regulations. And the services your project receives funding for will be again determined by your project application. Um, and two things to note here, Staff and overhead costs directly related to carrying out these activities are eligible, but they should be charged to that budget line item. Um, and the costs of the day-to-day -day operations of a supportive services facility are not eligible. So expenses like maintenance, repair, building security, furniture, utilities, and equipment would not be considered um, an eligible cost. Next slide. Um, the next two slides are going to talk about eligible HMIS costs and project administration. Again, we're not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but just wanted to give you an overview because these are and can be included in your um, project budgets. So HMIS costs, any project can have an HMIS budget associated with the data collection um, component. So things like purchasing or leasing computer hardware, software, licenses, leasing office space, salaries, trainings, and reporting. Next slide. Project administration funds can be used to pay for costs under three main categories. The first is general management, oversight and coordination. The second is trainings. And the third is environmental reviews. Um, as most of you already know, um, recipients are required to offer at least 50% of the project administration funds, administrative funds to subrecipients. Um, and the cost of carrying out other, other eligible activities should be charged to those specific budget line items not project administration. And just wanna call out the distinction between this project administration um, line item versus your general administration funding that 
you know, you may get in another grant. This is specific to the project. Um, so that's why we, we kind of want to call out the difference um, between the two. So there's three specific categories um, that would be eligible under this administrative cost line item. Uh, next slide, please. So we're just linking here some additional cost resources. Um, again, if you want to look further into it or if you have questions, just please send them our way. But um, these are a couple of links for your reference. All right, I think that's it. Um, does anyone have questions about what we just covered? I'm trying to look through the chat. Stacy, one question um, was lifted up about the security deposits, um, what the COC program allows versus what um, current law allows. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah. I put a written answer just so people could have the reference, but unfortunately the short answer is no. If your local um, rules for rentals are they can only ask for one month's deposit, then COC program can only um, offer one month deposit. It's um, covered, it's, it's HUD expects that they aren't going to pay more just because they're federal funds. So that is why you have to follow the local restrictions and caps. So COC program money wouldn't be able to do that um, directly um, because it would be in conflict with this new requirement. Thanks, Lonnie. Um, yeah, I see another question that someone just put in the chat box. If you can pop that over to the Q&A, uh, that would be great because then we can have a written um, document that we can publish this out to everybody. But the question is, can we have a project that has rapid rehousing and SSO together? So that's a great question. And, you know, HUD loves the jargon. All federal funding sources do. So um, rapid rehousing projects can have a supportive services budget line item, but SSO is support services only project. So that's something that none of us have really been able to do in probably 15 years with HUD money unless you um, applied for the unsheltered NOFO. So rapid rehousing projects can have a supportive service budget line item to help with the list of um, eligible costs that Stacy showed you, but um, you would technically still be a rapid rehousing program. You would just have a rental assistance budget line item, a supportive services budget line item, and an admin budget line item. And you'd have to track things in each of those categories. Um, we'll talk about this more when we talk about invoicing and you know deeper financial things in future trainings. But I just want to highlight, because I think it's a very common model, that the person doing the rental calculation and the person doing the case management under a RAPID program might be the same person. They might be different people. So if you do have like the three budget line items and you're one person doing three different things, it's really important that you're setting up your timekeeping to look at those items and track them. So if I was doing all three things, um, I was rental assistance activities, I was a supportive service person and I was admin, then I would be, um, my timesheet would have three different lines and I would be entering my day based on kind of which hat I was wearing. Maybe one day I'm all case management, the next day I'm all admin, whatever it is for how your um, project works. And yes, leasing is the same thing. A leasing project, which would be a uh, permanent supportive housing or transitional project can also have a supportive services budget line item. So basically all the rules of what can and can't be put together are typically in your NOFO documents. So that's your annual reference for the current rules of the road <laughs> as HUD has laid them out. Mm. Stacey, are there any other questions that we wanna tackle now versus kind of going as we go forward? Um, yeah, I think we can go on to the next section. I'll try to answer some in the Q&A that I'm seeing pop up. And then, of course, we'll have time at the end to have folks chime in. So um, I will hand it over to you, Melanie. 
Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, continue putting questions in that Q&A feature and we'll continue to triage them as we go through. Okay, so that was a brief overview of kind of the key program components of permanent housing and then the eligible costs, right? The whole world that's available to you that you narrow down in your project application. Um, now we're gonna go into kind of the meat of the topic for this training, which is match. Um, so we're gonna start by talking about the grant cycle for match. And before we do that, we're gonna do a poll because I saw a lot of you were kind of new to this um, topic about costs and match. Now I'd like to know if you have some of the terminology and what types of projects you've put together so I can kind of focus. So the question that came up in your poll should be, what type of match do you have for your project? You can have in-kind, which I'll explain a lot more about. Um, you can have cash match, which we all love, but is very scarce. You could have both. You could have a, um, multiple sources of match. Um, or maybe some of you are not sure because these are new terms and you need to know what they are. Or maybe you need to go get your project application so you can see what you did promise to HUD. Um, so go ahead and answer that poll. And Jody, when you see kind of a majority of people have responded, we can publish that out. Um, and while you're doing that, if we're talking today and you're like, I don't know that, I don't know what the answer is, someone within your agency has access to your project application in eSnaps. If you're not that person and you're not friends with that person yet, you want to get together and get that project application into your grant management files so that you can reference it when questions like this come up. So that's just a best practice I would offer out. So, okay. So the results of the poll are a lot of people, 57% have both. So you've had to use multiple match sources, which is very common. And a few of you want to know more about these um, resources, and a few of you are lucky enough to have one or the other um, in your project as you're managing um, rolling out this um, funding stream. So great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Here, I wanted to orient us to um, what the grant cycle is for match, because this is where a lot of people make a mistake is they think about match once and then they don't think about it again until they have to do their reporting. So I feel like it's really helpful to just lay this out for you. You're going to be thinking about match at least five times throughout the course of a project term. So during your application, HUD asks you to identify what you think you're going to be used for matching funds, where they're going to come from, how much they are. That's something you're doing at application that you're submitting through your COC that your COC then submits to HUD for review. So that's the first place where you kind of design your project and think about match. You apply for your project, but you don't actually see those funds if you're awarded for, let's say, six to 10 months. And the world can change a lot in six to 10 months, as you all know. So at grant execution, HUD is going to ask you again to just confirm what your matching funds will be for that project. Could be exactly the same as you put in your application, or it could have changed and you need to kind of redesign and get new commitments for your match. At grant execution, if you have certain types of match, like in-kind services that we'll talk about, you're going to need additional documentation in order to go to a grant agreement and be able to launch your new program or access your renewal funds. If you have a brand new program, HUD is going to ask you for match documentation at the beginning of it. If you have a renewal project, they have a right to ask you for it at grant execution, but they don't have to. That doesn't mean you don't have to have it. So don't wait for HUD to ask you at grant execution, just have that as part of your um, project file so you can um, reference it. You also have to do an annual progress report um, and you should be looking at that data quarterly just to make sure everything's going into HMIS and your finance um, system as you hope. That is where you're gonna document the progress towards meeting your match obligations most of you are in a one-year renewal cycle, so that means you'll be doing this every year. 
you're going to report out to HUD in each budget line item and each subcategory of the budget line items what you spent the, um, your funds on that the HUD gave you. And at the bottom, there'll be a box and it says, how much is your match? Has to be at least 25% of the um, funds that you spent, excluding leasing funds. So leasing doesn't require a match, but all other funds spent in any of the other budget line items, they do require um, a 25% match across all those categories. And again, we'll talk a lot more about all these things that I've just brought up. And then one to three years later, when HUD comes to monitor you after the project closed, they can then request the documentation and the backup for the match. So they don't ask you for that at project close. They assume you have it. And within their monitoring um, term, they can ask you for that documentation and they will. Match is one of the number one issues that HUD has seen across projects. And they are being very strict about match documentation and being able to prove that whatever you say you spent the money on, you can show exactly where it went and how it related to the project. So a lot of people, again, think about match once and then they move on, but you wanna be checking in on it throughout your project and you can be asked for it within like a five-year period. Someone can ask you a match question about your application. So keep really good files. Okay, let's dive into kind of what the match rules are. We can go to the next slide um, for the COC program. So HUD allows, like we've talked about, two kinds of match. Cash, which is exactly what it sounds like, right? That's a check coming into you going into your budget and you're spending it out on eligible costs or in-kind contributions, which are um, services or possibly operating or volunteering um, services to the project that come from outside of your agency typically. So maybe you're the housing um, part of the program and you have a mental health agency that's willing to do case management, in-kind service match, you would have an MOU with them because they're outside of your agency to say for project ABC, I'm going to commit, um, you know, up to two um, staff to be used for X project within dates times. And we'll go over what an MOU has to include, but um, there are the two types. It has to be spent on eligible costs that HUD would pay for. Um, I always tell people for match, HUD thinks of it as their funds, right? You're providing it, but you're using their rules. So you want to treat match just like you treat the COC program funds. All of the same rules apply. It's only, you can only count it as match if HUD would have paid you for it, if they could pay you for 100% of the cost of a project. You're going to have a lot of costs or some costs, hopefully not a lot, um, that are perfectly reasonable, but they're not eligible based on this funding stream. So you are going to have costs that aren't match and aren't COC program fund um, reimbursable. So when you think match, think about the regular COC program um, eligible costs and rules. So HUD has clarified in the past five years that program income that we'll talk about at the bottom of this um, session can be used as match which is really great. Um, but again, you're all wearing different hats. You're here with different project designs. Typically, the only type of project that's going to generate program income in an appropriate, allowable way is projects with a leasing budget line item. Sometimes if you're an operating, that general operating um, model we talked about, sometimes you may also generate program income. Program income is typically when a participant is paying you directly for part of the rent because you've paid the rent already based on the model and design of your project. So, but they have clarified it can be used as match, but not all programs generate program income. So it's just really important to know that. Um, okay, next slide. What is cash match? Um, so cash match is, like I said, it's the actual cash that you receive and that you as the recipient, the grant holder with HUD or the subrecipient are spending out on eligible activities throughout this deck. And when you get the, um, the PDFs and the links, 
I have hyperlinked to the frequently asked questions, the FAQs that HUD has posted about each of these different types of match. So you'll see that on the slides, but they are hyperlinked in the document that you'll received also. So cash match, like I said, it's a check coming in and it's funds going out. HUD wants to see any cash match going through your general accounting system, the way you track all of your income and expenses for your agencies and your projects. HUD should be able to see that check come in, get deposited to your bank account, then it comes out the other side and we say we got $10,000 and then it paid for Melanie's salary for 20 hours, Stacy's hour, salary for 10 hours. It should be very clear where it goes in and where it goes out so HUD can um, quickly check that it was things they would have paid for if they were able to um, fully support um, the project 100%. Again, you're going to be spending things that, um, spending money on things that aren't eligible for COC program. So those are not um, considered match. They're usually referred to as leverage um, funds, not match funds. But the key here is if you have cash match, you and your finance staff should be talking about that and making sure that you can trace it through and that your auditors and HUD can trace it through your financial system so that you can clearly show that you got the money and you spent it on something eligible. Okay, next slide. So in-kind match is, like I said, you typically from an outside partner, um, someone who's part of your um, community who's also providing um, homeless services or crisis response services. So in-kind match is the value of real property, equipment, goods, or services that are contributed directly to your COC program grant or project that HUD would have paid for if they paid for your full project. Um, goods and services provided by another project to the COC program are allowed. Um, it could be that there's a United Way funded case management project and they're matching yours. So it can be a standalone project that's partnering with yours. It just has to be eligible. They have to be allowed to give it to you as match. Um, and then in-kind match resources, I've talked about them as an external resource. They may also be internal. So it could be that your agency is large or has multiple functions. Maybe you have a housing program, a rapid rehousing program project that was funded by the COC program, but you're also a mental health agency or a community support agency who also has a case management team. If that case manager is not directly assigned to the project, if they have their own team and there's an own, their own intake process for that service, then they're in-kind match. They're just internal to your agency. So you may have a memo of agreement internally so that everybody knows like, yes, we're accessing half of a case manager to match this rapid grant. So if you're trying to think, am I in-kind or am I cash? Like, what am I? If you're within the project budget, you're coming out on those financials, you're tracked, right? You're, you're assigned to just one project, you're probably cash. If you're a partner, you're a division within two, um, one agency, then it's probably in kind. And we'll talk about kind of the things that you need to document to show what that relationship is and keep it going um, throughout the life of the project. Next slide. So we talked a lot about what match is. And now we're going to just clearly tell you the things that I know match isn't based on what HUD has um, told us in the past. So cash or in-kind contributions that are used as match for another grant cannot be used twice. So if you have that $10,000 United Way grant and you're already using it to match your PSH program, it can't also be used to match your RAPID program. If the $10,000 is split 50-50, then you can, but you can't spend the same dollar twice. Cash or in-kind contributions that are prohibited as being match also cannot be used. That makes sense. If you have in-kind services, which is the top source of match for a lot of COC programs, if they're provided without the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, HUD can't allow you to use count that as match. It's wonderful and it happened, but in-kind services without an MOU, 
HUD can determine them ineligible as match and ask you to pay back funds. So the MOU came along with the COC program interim rule, and it's very important and HUD is monitoring very carefully to those MOUs in many cases. So as we talk about in-kind services, um, you really wanna think carefully, like, do I have those MOUs? Um, if you help people who are in the project create savings accounts and they put money in it every month to um, use after they exit the project for whatever costs they've identified they might have, those are not match either. Anything that belongs to the program participant is not matched. So someone has food assistance, not match. If they have a savings account, that's not match. Um, federal benefits, like I said, like a food assistance or even sometimes utility assistances, if it's directly to the person and not to the project, then it's not match. And like I've said, if it's ineligible for COC program, it's probably helpful, but it's not going to be considered match. So we'll go to the next slide. So I've talked about kind of the types of match, but let's talk about what the actual requirements are. As you put together this puzzle, what do you actually have to be able to do? So for match requirements, number one thing is you have to be able to document all the costs using the same policies and procedures that you're using to support the drawdown of money from your COC program project. So it has to be documented and it has to follow the same rules that HUD would expect of their funds being spent. The matching requirement for COC program projects is 25% cash or in kind for all of the budget line items that are in your project that were approved, except for leasing funds. So if you have a leasing budget line item, you would back that out and 25% of the remaining budget, that's what the um, match requirement would be. It's also required that the match is to the specific um, program and project, but thankfully it can be for um, any budget line item. So if you have, let's see, a rapid rehousing program that has leasing and maybe operating to pay for utilities not included in the lease, but you didn't have a supportive service, you're getting all your services through MOUs um, for in-kind services, that's okay, that's still match. HUD doesn't have to fund you for an eligible activity for your project type for it to be considered match. It's anything that's eligible for your project design. And again, matching funds can only be used on eligible costs. I'll probably say that many more times because it's a number one mistake that people make. So next slide. So here's an example just to see a visual on the difference it makes between using leasing funds um, and not having leasing funds. We have a supportive services budget line item in both projects. The first one on your left has a rental assistance, $20,000. The one on your right has leasing. Both have project administration um, and the grand total. So because the one on the left without leasing funds all of those, that full 49,500 has to have matching dollars identified, the match would be 12,375. If I'm a leasing project um, on the right-hand side, then I have um, a lesser match because I back out all of that leasing money. So my required match would be $7,375. So again, if you have a PSH leasing project, this is something that, um, why some people pick that design. There are pros and cons. I'm not um, advocating for either one. Rental assistance and leasing both have their pros and cons, but just wanted you to see the difference in the match requirements depending on your project type. Okay, next slide. So here is just, again, a visual on how the match, it doesn't have to be apples to apples anymore. It can be apples and oranges, as long as it's all eligible. So here you see a project that has operating money, no service money from HUD, a little bit of project admin. Um, in their match, they've brought in services, either in-house or in-kind. Um, they have had to supplement their project administration um, budget. 
and there matches the 27.5 that they um, need to provide to HUD as the 25%. Um, so you can match things that HUD's, you can use things that HUD isn't paying for as long as they could have paid for it if you had put it in your HUD budget. So again, just a visual to know that now it, you can match apples and oranges instead of having it be a line by line um, restriction. Okay, next slide. So some of the examples people ask, like, where do I get this match? <laughs> like, where does the cash match come from? Uh, sometimes agencies have it themselves. So it could be that you uh, do a lot of fundraising, you have unrestricted funds from your city or a foundation, whoever your um, partners are in supporting your agency. So that's one place that cash match comes from. Uh, federal government grants, um, sometimes those are put in as general funds. It's not uh, frequent, um, but that is a possibility. Um, state and local government grants and contracts sometimes can be seen as cash because they may allow you to use them on a host of activities and you push them into particular project budgets based on your negotiations. And then of course, private grants. If you have relationships with um, foundations or benefactors or um, donors um, that are from agencies, that may be where you're getting cash match to put into the project directly versus a partnership with the project. Okay, we're gonna go to the next slide. So here you're gonna see a couple examples and I just want you to think about as we're talking them through kind of what where you would categorize these. So um, as you can see, I like to use United Way as an example. So the first one in the top left is United Way gives the recipient or subrecipient $15,000 to fund a case management um, section at the HUD funded project level. So if we're looking at that and we kind of review what I've said, this one would be considered match because it's being given directly to the project and case management is an allowable cost for COC program models. If we go to the gray box, it says the project recipient or subrecipient enters into an MOU with Victory Inc. to provide substance abuse counseling. So if I added onto that four project participants, if I'm being really particular, then yes, if you have the MOU, um, substance abuse counseling is an eligible supportive service um, and you're documenting that it's for the project participants that you're counting it as match, then that absolutely would be match, eligible as match. You would need to trace it back to the participant. They would need to be able to tell you the dates of the encounters, how much each encounter cost, and then show the payroll records out for those encounters, however they reimburse their staff. So you still have to show the full financial trail. It's just going to be in another agency's um, accounting system. So if we go to the light blue box on the left, bottom left, subrecipient uses a donated van to transport clients to job training, GED classes, and weekend movies. So before I give you this answer, I want you just to think about it for a couple seconds. Um, would you say yes, no, maybe I would need more information? That's what I always ask myself when someone asks me a COC program question, like, do I need more information? I probably do. So for this one, the answer is maybe. And if it's a yes, it would probably need to be also prorated. So subrecipient, a donated van is great. Job training, yes. GED classes related to having to go back for education to secure employment, yes. Weekend movies, no. So if you had a donated van and you were using it to transport clients in a COC program projects project, you would have to have a log of when that van is used and have a method within your agency of how you're allocating out the gas costs, the insurance, whatever it is you have to do to pay for that van once you have it um, in your possession, you would have a way to prorate that based on how it's being used across multiple programs, or even if it's within one program, the weekend movies, all of that time and mileage and gas and insurance, it would just have to be prorated out. 
So if that was 10%, then you would just take that out. The 90% maybe match. This is something that typically, again, an operating program um, may have, um, but it just, it's an example of yes, but, and some tracking would be involved. Okay. Um, the Department of Labor provides a recipient with a contract to pay for the gas to transport clients to job training, GED classes, and weekend movies. So think about that one for a second. We have a contract, so that's good. We are paying for gas, which is eligible under transportation. Job training, still yes. GED classes, still yes. Weekend movies, no. So um, again, this would be tracking. The gas costs would be going through your accounting system. There would be a log on how they're allocated to different projects. Um, so again, this would be a yes, but there would be some tracking that you would have to do to make sure that you're only charging, um, only counting the eligible costs as the match. So those are just some examples of how it can be really straightforward or not straightforward at all and have a little more documentation burden. I'll probably say this in future slides, but I'll say it now. Also, I recommend that people go after the largest, easiest match category that you can. I'm going to talk about everything that can be um, match, but if you don't have to track gas and mileage, that's great. Go after something bigger like a case management MOU. So I'm going to tell you all the things you can do. But when you design your project, you want to go after the biggest source of match. So you have the least amount of admin burden and documentation. So you want to simplify your life as much as possible. Okay, next slide. Here we have, we're gonna take a couple questions and then we've been going for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes. We're gonna take a quick 10 minute break. But before that, Stacey, are there any questions that we should field before we go to the break um, that you wanna lift up? Yeah, we have a couple related to match. So I'm thinking, can look at those. One of them is around if they get a check that comes in to support the program for food, for example, do they need to provide proof of that? Or how would they provide proof of that if they didn't have it at the time of contract execution? Okay, that makes sense. So I'm going to talk more about that in the second half. Okay, so, um, Cynthia, if I don't answer it, we'll, we're going to leave it up in the qu open questions. If I don't answer it as we go forward, we'll come back to that at the end. Okay, what about this one? Is this HMS match documentation only for subrecipients and not direct recipients? Um, no, so um, recipients and subrecipients decide how they're gonna divvy up the program execution. So if the recipient is the one doing the HMIS data entry and they're tracking that on their timesheets and can show how many hours and the cost and, you know, again, all through the pay, payroll and accounting system, then that would be fine. So HMIS um, eligible costs at the project level, um, that match can, it can be at the recipient or the separate recipient level, um, whether it's your funds you're putting into it or a grant that you're getting or a license that you're paying for. So um, no, it depends on your project design, but it could be recipient or subrecipient. Perfect. And then one previous one related to leasing line items. Sure. Um, can you explain the difference between a leasing budget line item and general? Does leasing budget line item mean you lease the unit used for your project and general is by the property you own? Um, I think I understand the question, but if I don't, pop another question into the chat. So, um, yes. Yeah, so when HUD does a budget, right, it's, they have, there's a budget chart. It's a grid and it has leasing, rental assistance, operating. So if you're a leasing budget line item, you have a specific amount of money there. Um, I think by general, you mean the operating costs that I talk about. It would just say right in your budget, operating in a certain amount of money. So a leasing budget line item um, means, the leasing model means that you are renting units from landlords in the community. You are paying them the full rent 
and you are getting participants and then subleasing um, that unit to them. Um, you can't, like Stacy said, own the properties that you're using for leasing budget line item unless you get prior HUD approval. Um, general operating, it can be a pro property that you own. It's a very old model that I don't see a lot of new projects being designed with. It could be something you're renting too. So that's where all the terms kind of get um, messed up. That's why I tell everyone, go back to your project application, figure out who you are, and then figure out which rules apply to you. So hopefully that helps. If I didn't get the question right, just go ahead and pop it into the Q&A again. So I, I think last one, yeah. Melanie, I don't know if you're going to cover this later, but do we need an MOU for all of the different cash matches? How does that work if funds are raised at a fundraising event? Yeah, so cash match, no, you do not need an MOU because you're going to show the check coming in. You're going to put it in your bank account, in your general accounting, and then you're going to show the funds going out within your own program to an eligible cost within that project. So thankfully, cash match does not require an MOU. You just have to show that you spent it on eligible funds. The MOU is for the outside in-kind services because you're not managing those, right? Like you're, it's a partnership. So um, we'll talk a lot more about that. So let's take a quick, um, let's do a six minute break, if that's okay. I know we have 10 here, but let's do a six minute break um, and come back at, ooh, I'm on the East Coast. So I'm going to say 6.05, but Stacy or Jody, what time is that where you are? 3.05. <laughs> 3.05. So don't come back at 6.05, come back at 3.05. <laughs> um, okay. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, keep putting questions in, um, in the chat and we'll answer them as we go along. Um, now I wanted to talk to you, I've talked a little bit about record keeping, but let's dive deeper into record keeping. We'll go next slide. Um, this is um, a visual of all the things you have to do <laughs> if you are a COC program um, recipient or subrecipient. These are all the things you have to talk um, do for your record keeping. We're just gonna talk about match today. So we'll go right to the next slide. Um, for record keeping, um, again, as I said, at the top of this section, um, you have to maintain um, written documentation. Um, you have to have it from the source, right? Like um, that's giving you the funds for matching or has signed an MOU with you. Your job is to have the records at your organizational level, your project level, and your participant file level. So your organization is typically your finance stuff, your um, award letters, your grant applications, uh, your project level may be um, specific ways you're staffing the project, um, things that you're using for match that are in kind or like the van, um, um, example, and in your participant files, if you are having um, match that is done by an internal mechanism, you might have those case notes, or your peer department might have those case notes. If you have an MOU um, for the services in their participant files, they would have those case notes about dates um, of contact and what they worked on. So you have many different levels, depending on kind of what part of the match um, process your in. So let's go to the next slide. Here's just another visual of kind of the three times that you are going to be forced to think about match by the HUD process. First, again, is that application, that project award. HUD may ask you for documentation. They may not. They still expect it to be there. And at the project term, this is where don't wait till the 12th month um, but you have to, at least at the project um, termination and the end of the contract, did you spend the cash match that you allocated? Did your in-kind partner actually provide substance abuse services or case management or whatever they promised you? Do you have the documentation? Did they have the documentation? Are you going to have access to that and for how long? And can you prove, if you're using your own accounting systems, that it actually went to an eligible cost? Can I, as a stranger, come in and say, yep, that was spent on one hour of case management? 
So these are the questions you want to ask yourself and go back and um, talk about after this training to make sure they're in place. Next slide. Here again is just a written version of what I've told you. So I'm not going to read this to you, but I just wanted you to have this as a reference for what you have to have for documentation at each of the different steps. Here, this next series of slides is going to be the FAQs, those frequently asked questions that are posted on the HUD exchange. So you can see here for cash match documentation, they want it to be in writing on the agency's letterhead that gave it to you, signed and dated by someone authorized to give you the cash. So when you're doing your application, it might be that someone is promising you cash for the future, but you don't have a contract yet because it's not coming to your project starts, which may be 10 months away. So if someone's promising you cash match or you're providing cash match, right, you're kind of promising within your agency resources, that should be written out, right? Um, I keep, I'll just keep picking on United Way. They would say, you know, like, we um, will be giving you an award for this project for this much, and it should be signed by someone who is authorized to make financial decisions based on that agency. I say that multiple times because I've seen many letters where the project a manager is signing it or there's it's more of a handshake versus like a finance department and um, executive team has made this commitment. It really has to be someone who has the authorization to do this. In that letter, you need to say how much cash, what date the cash is going to be available. It might be your whole grant term, might be part of your grant term, depending on funding cycles, when they're going to allow you to use it. So which what what are their boundaries? And the last one is what everybody leaves off. What can it be used for? So they can't just say, I'm going to give you $10,000 to do whatever you want with. They need to be explicit to say, I'm going to give you $10,000. It can be used on COC program eligible costs, such as it can be used just on case management, just on rental assistance. So you have to have a little bit of detail there so that HUD knows it's eligible for things they want to pay for, not just anything that's possible. So that's cash match. Next slide. Um, is in-kind goods? This I really don't see a lot because again, it's um, typically not a lot of money, but if you have a large goods documentation source, um, match source, then great. Um, in-kind donations, um, again, writing letterhead when you're doing the application, when you actually get the donation, you would have a description and a value of the donated goods. So this is kind of starting to answer that food question. Um, a specific date when you're getting the um, donation, the grant that you can use it for. So you might have a relationship with someone. They say for calendar year 2025, this is what I'm going to give you. This is how much. And a lot of things, right? Like how do you determine how, how, what the value is? The letter has to say like how you're going to determine that. Are you going to do comparables? Are you going to have actual costs? If someone's buying something, then giving it to you, you're going to have a receipt. Those are the types of things you need to include in your in-kind in -kind goods match documentation. Okay, next slide. So services match. Again, a lot of this is going to be for your reference. I'm happy to answer questions but I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm constantly going back to the rule and these FAQs and I take my MOUs and I check off all of these boxes to make sure everything's there. So for your MOUs, for your in-kind services, it has to be in place prior to the provision of the service. So if your grant starts in February, if your MOU starts in March, you can't count anything to happen in February. So line it up with your grant term. Again, what are they going to specifically give you? Substance abuse, case management. Who's going to be giving it? And how much is their um, hourly cost or per session cost? If it's psychiatric, sometimes they come up. The time frame, are they offering you for the whole project, part of the project year? And most importantly, again, the last bullet is always the thing that people leave off. How are you going to document the actual thing that happened? Not the promise, not the plan, but what actually happened um, for the project and the clients. That is what you want to put in your MOU, your contract with them, so that you have access to the records. They know what you're going to request at quarterly or end of year. Um, that's a really important thing to work out with partners before everybody's surprised when you ask for their client files. 
Okay, next slide goes into more detail. Again, reference for you. HUD wants to know who, what, when, um, and your method. So this is just more detail um, from the slide before about kind of specifically how many clients. If someone says they're gonna provide transportation, if your project's for 100 people, is it for 100 or is it 10? It doesn't have to be for everybody that's part of your project. You just really wanna quantify what it is so that you can then, as the project's rolling out, actually make sure that that's happening, that people are going to that service for transportation or going for psychiatric services, whatever it is that you're bringing in through in-kind services. Okay, next slide, I think is gonna be a poll. I don't think we need to do this because we've kind of learned in the um, first poll where people were coming from. So let's skip this and go into some cash match documentation um, slides. So I apologize ahead of time. I know this is small, um, but um, it's just, again, supposed to give you a visual of what cash match looks like if you're not a finance person. So here you see, I've been talking about the general ledger, United Way gives that $100,000 um, uh, grant to your agency. You can see in the bottom right corner, I have the letter like, hey, congratulations, here's your grant. I can see how much it is, it's $100,000. If I go back up to the top to the blue and white lines, I can see it's $100,000. I can see exactly how I'm gonna spend that $100,000. I can see what I'm gonna match within those lines. It's very clear what the, hundred, what the amount is, what I spent it on. So if I know I'm spending 25,000 on mental health and counseling services, I can then go to those files and those payment sources and say, okay, I had $25,000, did I spend it on staff? Did I spend it on, you know, what is it that I spent that money on? So this is a good example. The next slide is a bad example. So you'll see the letters missing. <laughs> The numbers don't add up. I have $100,000, but I spent 140. That means that somebody isn't actually getting the dollar. We're not actually providing that service. So if the math doesn't add up and you can't back up what happened, then this is gonna raise questions. So this is that kind of like trace it through, um, work with your finance department. So next slide. So how to do this well and not end up in a pickle at the end of your operating year. I highly recommend that you look quarterly at your match sources, whether they're internal or external, to make sure you got there, right? Co um, coordinated entry determines all of your referrals for your openings in your project. So if you have a substance abuse counseling contract as a match with an MOU that supports it, but the folks in your program, that's not the thing that they're working on or the um, issue that they came with, then you're not gonna use that, right? It's, it's great source of match, but if you don't actually use it, it doesn't count. So again, the plan versus the reality, it's really important because let's say no one is accessing the substance abuse services or the substance abuse services, they're having a staffing crisis. So they can't provide what they thought they could you can recalibrate, find a new partner, change course, get a new MOU and implement that so that you don't fall short of your match. As a quick check, as you're doing the quarterly, you might, instead of gathering all the charts, you might wanna gather like third-party billing data. If someone is providing services that are paid for by insurance or other grant funds, maybe the billing department, right, can provide you just an overview of how much service your participants got from them. But then you would follow up with, okay, let's make sure that the case notes got written and like you can dig down deeper. But just checking in on billing data might be a way to kind of get a sense of what's going on. Did your plan actually execute the way you thought it was? If you have a lot of partner agencies, um, have uniform guidance. If you as projects can get together and if everybody's asking the mental health agency for case management match, one process makes that manager's job easier to help you all and have you say yes. So within your agency and within partner agencies, try and make things as uniform as possible. And if you can agree on tracking processes, it makes everybody's life easier and it makes it easier for them to say yes 
to you. Um, and then, sorry, I think these are duplicate, the top two um, initial review. Sorry, those are duplicate. I really leaned on third-party billing data, so my apologies. Um, but yeah, so those are just some things um, looking at it. Um, don't wait till the end of your grant year. It's very painful when you have to write a check. Um, when you're doing match, HUD is going to look at the amount of funds you spent and you have to provide matching funds on what you spent, not on what you were awarded. So that's really key too. If you were awarded $100,000, but you spent $80,000, you only have to match the 80,000 minus any leasing. So if you're at the end of your grant term and you're like sweating because you're falling short of that 25%, make sure you look at the actual dollar spent. I really hope you're spending your whole grant, but if you're not, look at the actual dollar spent. That's what HUD's going to hold you to. If you do not have documentation of 25% match, they will say, please write me a check for X number of dollars for the services that you couldn't match that you're below the 25% that is within their right and they're actively doing it. So let's go to the next slide. Here are a bunch of resources. Again, a lot are hyperlinked within the slides. There's some videos that HUD has put up, but here your FAQs are really your main source of like, how do you get the documentation right? And the other ones are really kind of orientation materials to make sure you can kind of just get the jargon down. Um, as you move forward. So we'll do next slide. Stacy, I'm gonna hold on match questions. I'm just gonna do the quick program income part of this because it's super quick. And then we can answer all the questions that came up that we have time for. Sounds good. Great. Okay, financial management. There's a lot to financial management, but what we're gonna talk about today, if you go to the next slide, we're gonna specifically be talking about um, program income. So here, again, for your reference, because this is, you know, very complicated regulation, these are all the things you need to think about during your financial management. You can see the second bullet, match requirements, that's what we're focusing on. And then the um, towards the bottom, program income sources and uses, those are the two things from this list that we're going to be focusing on today, but I wanted to give you this as a reference for other things that HUD's going to expect from you about drawdowns, at least quarterly, but you should do them monthly, all those types of things. So you have it as reference as you apply for new projects or manage your current projects. Okay, next slide. So um, program income versus a program fee. So program income is allowed you can generate program income through eligible activities. You cannot, under any circumstance, have a program fee. They are not allowed in any COC program design. The way HUD is thinking about fees and talks about fees is, at its simplest, a program fee is anything, any fee that's assessed other than rent, if you're a rental assistance program, or occupancy charges if you're a leasing program that chooses to implement a charge for staying in that unit. It prohibits all of those. This includes damages and includes charging people for if they're locked themselves out for key fees. There's no fees that you can layer on top of a participant beyond rent or occupancy charges. Go to the next slide. I'll talk to you a little bit about what program income is. So program income is when you're doing COC program project work and somehow it's generating revenue back into your agency. So if you are a sponsor-based rental assistance, depending on how you structure that, you might be getting rent and then you might be paying the landlord. That could be considered program income in some field offices. If you're a leasing program, you pay the landlord and you have um, people pay 30% of the adjusted rent to you, that is program income. And you need to spend that back out on eligible costs. So most projects will take the program income that came in from charging occupancy charges and they'll put it towards the unit costs, right? They'll put it back in. That's how you fund the security deposits 
any staff time that you're charging to the leasing budget line item. Maybe you use it for to pay for a little bit of supportive services. Um, maybe you're using it to pay for um, utilities if you don't have an operating budget line item. But if you're if what you're doing is generating income, it has to come back to your project, not your agency. It has to come back to the project and be spent out within that project on eligible expenses. HUD has recently clarified that if you're providing a security deposit and it's getting returned to you instead of you letting the client take it, that is not considered program income. That's just a refund of project funds. So they have clarified that a return security deposit that they paid for then can't be considered program income. So you can't use HUD's money to match HUD money within a project, if that makes sense. Okay, next slide. Again, I kind of talked about this a lot. This is where you're going to have a conversation with your finance department about how they're tracking the money and then how they're spending it back out and how you can show that it was spent on the particular project that you're calling it for match and that you generated it from, that you're spending it during the grant term. HUD wants you to spend your money first, their money second. So if you're generating program income, you're leasing project charging rent, you have to pay expenses out of that bucket before you go to HUD and do drawdowns. So in every monthly invoice, you're going to hopefully see like, I spent $10,000. I have $2,000 in program income. I'm going to ask HUD for the remaining $8,000. That should be really clear within your invoices and your documentation. Again, there's an FAQ on this. It's hyperlinked here. Um, so no program fees. Program income is when you're generating and then spending it back within a project for eligible sources. Next slide. Again, more resources. These trainings are really great. You should have them as onboarding. You should look, up, look at them every once in a while. I'm in them at least once a month. Um, definitely go have your people go through these trainings so that they understand how HUD thinks. You can't always use logic. You have to follow the federal rules. So do these trainings, understand the HUD jargon and how they want to trace things through for these project awards. Next slide. General resources, just about all COC program topics. And then I think we're at the Q&A. Yes. Okay, Stacy, do you want to, are there any questions that we didn't answer in writing or that we should go back to? Yes, I see a couple have popped up. Okay. Um, I believe we answered Cynthia's. Feel free to chime in, Cynthia, again, if we didn't. Um, Shelly is asking for more clarification around um, if we have any kind case management. management match, how would we document that in HMIS? So I don't think you would. I, I mean, HMIS can be used for a lot of things. I don't usually see match. We might be conflating the, you might have a local requirement that you put case management notes in HMIS, which is separate from match documentation. It could be match documentation, but it also might not be. The agency might have charts. So I would say follow up with the COC program with that question because it's a little nuanced, but HMIS may be the source, but it's likely not. It's, your MOU will tell you kind of how to get the chart if, if case management is being tracked outside of HMIS by whoever your in-kind partner is. So other questions? It says, can we have leasing property for supportive services? Oh, that's a great question. Before I go into that answer, Jody, I see you've put up the QR code for the survey for um, this session. So while I'm answering questions, if people want to snap that and do the exit survey so we can, you know, continue to do trainings and get your feedback on this training, that would be great. Jody, do you have anything else to add before I go back to the questions? No, Melanie, thank you so much. It's been yeah. a fantastic training. Great. Um, okay, so to the leasing questions, can we have a leasing property for supportive services? Little yes, <laughs> I'm going to say little yes. So technically, yes, you can. You can have supportive services 
and you can lease a property for the people that are doing those services to sit in. It's very rare that the supportive service team is way far away in their own building doing their own thing. Typically, supportive services budgets within a program model, right, because all of you are housing projects, so you have rapid rehousing or PSH with a supportive service budget line item. If I am your case manager and I am sitting in a space, and if your agency says you're going to, each project's going to pay for the space, my budget would say, Melanie gets this salary. She has, I don't know, 100 square feet. This is how we figure out how much that is. That would be charged to the supportive services case management line item, right? Like it's like a sub line item. So the space for your service staff to sit were paid for by HUD. It's an eligible cost if that's how your agency charges out things, but it probably wouldn't, it's not going to be under leasing. It's very rare unless you're an SSO with like a big outreach team, which is a very rare thing for HUD to approve. Haven't done one in 15 years, unless you're unsheltered grants. Um, so I think the answer is no, but again, if it's a technical question, follow the COC program team and we can triage it. Thanks, Melanie. I think the only other question is we can address is where the where the recording of this training will be. We will be sending one out as well as posting it on our website under the training section. So you can look for it there. We'll have it. Okay. I think that's all the questions. Um, okay. I'm going to just see, talk a little bit more about the food example. Oh, yeah. Perfect. So, um, Depending on your project model, food may or may not be an eligible cost. That's the other thing to think about, right? Like, is food eligible? Did I budget for food? Did how to prove food? And is that what I want to track as match is really also a thing to think about. Um, you can change your match sources within your grant term. As long as you're documenting what you're doing, you have all the things on all those slides, right? Like, you can do that. Um, you just have to document it. You don't have to go to HUD every time and say, HUD, can I change my match source? They just anticipate at the end that you're going to have 25% match and you have good documentation about any changes. So if you're doing food, you just want to make sure that you have a really good tracking for how, how you're accounting for kind of what the value of it is. And typically I've only seen it like it's like to start up an apartment. So I have a rapid rehousing program. I give the first round of like food for like setting up the, you know, staples, but it's not typically an ongoing thing. That's more of a leveraging thing. But again, if you have a specific question, circle back with the COC team and we can triage it more specific to your situation, but you can change and add and subtract match sources. You just have to get the right documents before you do that. So that when HUD monitors you three years later, you're all set. So I know we're a couple minutes past and people have to jump off, but if there's any other questions, please reach out to Stacy and the COC team and we will do our best to answer them um, as we go forward and sign up for future trainings as they're announced. Great. Thanks, Melanie. And thank you everyone for joining. Hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks everybody.